Hey, what is going on everybody? And welcome back to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for getting ahead as a student, but a terrible resource for learning how to eliminate all the world's superheroes, build yourself a gigantic robot, distribute lots of technology to the rest of the world, and make sure that when everyone is special, no one is special. But we are talking about a different kind of syndrome today. This is true. <laughs> Did you like my intro? A much more attainable syndrome. <laughs> By the way, this one is going to be way easier to get than the one Depends you just Depends on how you think. What if you were born with the <clears throat> most incredible self-confidence? A.K.A. Then maybe, then maybe you could build the robot thing. and you could build the robot. Maybe you could do that. <clears throat> I was able to build this robot in a cave with a box of scraps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, how's it going, everybody? My name is Thomas Frank. I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Martin Bamey. And today, we're doing an episode on... Well, I think something that everyone deals with, but also something that everyone feels like they are uniquely alone in dealing with, and that is imposter syndrome, that feeling that uh, whatever it is you've chosen to do, you're not actually cut out for it, or you don't really belong, or you're just not good enough. Yeah. And uh, I guess like to put it as succinctly as possible, it's the feeling that you're a fake and that everyone else who's doing what you're doing is the real deal, but you're not. And I want to talk about that because I've dealt with it. Uh, I think that you've dealt with it before. I deal with it like every day. Every single day? Yeah. Actually, yeah, I do remember you mentioning, you know, more than once, like what qualifies me to talk on the internet I don't know what qualifies me to do anything. So, I think uh, in I terms of stuff. your expertise on this podcast, the the most frequent thing you've ever said is, I don't know, I guess I'll act like I'm mildly knowledgeable on the internet, Yeah, and hopefully it'll come across like I feel like, like I that's a large portion of my job is to, to <laughs> pretend I know stuff. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But I got to point something out. <clears throat> Last episode, did you, you don't look at the comments on the YouTube channel, do you? I do not, because I... Don't let things out of my head, so I know if I ever saw one negative thing, it would be in my head for too long and disrupt me from making the next thing I'm supposed to be making. That's fair. And a lot of creators have that problem. Yeah, I just I just don't look to avoid that happening. I'll see comments, and a lot of times if the comments are negative, <clears throat> I'm like, whatever, that's fine. But sometimes I think it's when a comment is negative and also blatantly stupid, and it comes from like... A position of arrogance but it's still blatantly stupid i it's very hard for me not to respond yeah yeah and I'm they just get like, you i really want to respond in such a snarky way right now but oh, no. you know what i should just go do my thing but wait but what if wait. i get a win I on the internet a, exactly i'm gonna sick burn <clears throat> this person so hard it's a waste of time nobody it, wins yeah <laughs> nobody wins in a dairy challenge did somebody put a terrible comment in the last one? <laughs> just a Is that the situation? <laughs> so nobody put a terrible comment in the last one, but the last one, nearly every single comment on the YouTube version of the episode is about my hair. Yeah? Not about the content of the episode <laughs> at all. And I don't, I don't remember why, because I think my hair is very similar right now. Look, guys, when I got to do the podcast, it's often like, I don't know, 9 a.m. when we got to do it. And some days, I just don't want to style my hair. Especially since the, my hair is really long right now. My hair is longer than it has ever been. Ever? I'm, ever. Wow. Yeah. Wait, maybe not ever, ever. When I was in eighth grade, I let it grow out pretty far, probably about this long, but I didn't know how to style it, and I did not know how to cut it correctly. I went to a Great Clips once, and they cut the top of my hair lar- shorter than the sides. <laughs> I looked like some kind of uh, like fryer wow. in training, you know. Like I haven't gotten to the point where I can shave the full top yet, but we're you gotta getting do there. that. You gotta it was do bad. That. So after that, I just didn't get a haircut for a super long time, and I grew out your typical eighth grade skater punk, you know, helmet hair. But since my hair is very straight, <clears throat> if I don't cut it correctly, it literally just becomes like Beatles style helmet hair. It's not very flattering. And then after that. I was like, I'm not going to a haircut place. I'm just going to cut it myself. So from like ninth grade until about two years ago, I just buzz cut my hair at one length all over my head. And hey, I saved a lot of money on haircuts. That's probably true. Like haircuts now are like they're like 40 bucks. My haircuts are quite expensive. Yeah. I used to go to a cheaper place and it was like 25 with tip. And then 
I went to, uh, I wanted to just like try a more expensive place. And I was like, this is gonna be an experiment. I'll probably go back to the cheap place. But the woman who cut my hair knew what she was doing. And she was explaining it and she was talking about the decisions she was making and like the geometry of it and how she was blending things. And I'm like, I can't go anywhere else now because this is an expert working. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I kind of know a little bit now what people with longer hair <clears throat> and like what my girlfriend deals with because man, it takes forever to dry and it takes forever to style it. And some days I just don't want to style my hair for internet credibility or yeah, that's praise. why we're talking about hair. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so some days you're just gonna get Tom with a K-pop haircut. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I'm sure that's what some people wanted anyway. Anyway, let's let's talk about imposter syndrome. Yeah, it's super fun. So yeah, um, where have you felt imposter syndrome the most? Um, let's see. Well, I feel imposter syndrome about basically everything, so that's a hard choice. Really? Um, the most obnoxious area where I feel it is where I feel like I'm an imposter to myself by convincing myself while I'm hanging out with friends that they like me. And then as soon as I leave, I convince myself, that's not true, Martin. They're not really, they don't like you. They secretly don't like you. And you then the imposter um, syndrome for friendship? <clears throat> yeah. How does that I work? feel like I don't fit in even right after leaving a situation where I clearly fit in. What's, what's the self-talk like there? Because, like, is there ever anything where people literally say something that you think is indicative of them not liking you? Or is it just, like... Uh, usually just I assume that everybody's being nice or, like, I, I, I'm i dumb. And at the moment, I feel really good about it. And then later, okay. I convince myself that actually I didn't fit in. And that secretly, it's way more fun when I'm not there. But I also feel imposter syndrome for... I felt it for my previous job. I feel it for this job. Sometimes I'll just feel anxious for no reason, and I'll be like, I should be fired. Everybody should fire me from no matter what job it is. I've, like, felt that mm -hmm. just for no reason. Um, I feel that way about my photography. I feel that way about my music. Um, basically everything that I could that possibly do. you got a four out of five on SputnikMusic.com oh, at that's, one time, though? That's true. <laughs> so... That's true. I don't know if you should feel imposter syndrome about your music. Like, I think the thing is, at some point, I get decent at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, I become actually decent. But at that point, it doesn't feel hard anymore. So I'm like, well, of course you're decent. It's easy. It feels easy. You don't even have to. But oh, like, that's, yeah. you, that's how, what it feels like to get good at something. But then I justify it inversely by saying, you're only good at it because it's so easy. It's not easy because you're good at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. Especially with the easy thing. Like, when I'll make a video about something I think is easy, I'm just like, this is this is just like the most base level stuff. You yeah. Know? Somebody who's a real expert would be talking about more complicated, difficult stuff right now. But I'm not, so I'm not qualified to do this or i'm not i guess i'm not at the same level yeah. i didn't blow my own mind with this information <laughs> that's what it is yeah Wait, like, how are you gonna do that sometimes i'm doing a video where when i come up with a topic i'll know all right this is good information that people need to know and then when i'm doing it i'm like well i didn't really have to go learn anything crazy for this so it just it's all obvious why am i talking about it yeah you know it, it's funny because like if i were to do a video about something that i think is intellectually challenging a lot of times it's too esoteric yeah, it's like it's you not know? like nobody else even knows what you're talking about. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. very specific. Like when I did that video on the major system for like yeah. memorizing numbers yeah. and building memory palaces and stuff. Like, you know, I think part of the problem with that video is I just didn't, I did not go at it from the right angle. You know, I think like the real stupid decision was deciding to memorize a random number instead of saying I'm going to memorize pi, which would have been way more relatable. Yeah, but even still, like. People in the comments were like, all right, this is cool, but why do we need to memorize long strings of numbers? For robots and, when they take over. Exactly, right? Because they're going to be like, all right, to, to determine your, your worth as a human being, please recite the first 862 digits of pi. It's a very easy number, but yeah, we have to set the bar low for you human beings. So start reciting. But yeah, like... I made that video and I was like, this is super fascinating. And also it's a high level concept. So I'm going to feel more like an expert when I talk about it. And then people were like, this is not 
useful. <laughs> yeah. Whereas we do a video like, all right, here's some things you should stop doing before you go to bed. And, and people love it. And it's like, well, it seemed obvious, but sometimes we need reminders of the obvious things. Yeah. Well, and I feel like a lot of, a lot of stuff in this area, you know, we're trying to do sort of productivity stuff, self improvements. A lot of that's is obvious stuff. A lot of that, like, I feel like most people, if they sat down and thought about it for three seconds, yeah. wouldn't know at least one good step to move forward on something. Mm-hmm. But like, sometimes you need to hear it from somebody else. I could have uh, Ashley tell me something over and over and I'll be like, okay, but then I'll read it somewhere else. And the problem is that she didn't have it in the exact right sentence that like, that brought something to me. Like yeah. somebody will word the same thought that she had perfectly. And all they did was change the sentence. And I'll be like, I'm inspired now. And she'll be like, I've been telling you this. And I'll be like, the prose was not beautiful enough. (laughs) Inspire me. But I think it's something more than just the prose. I think actually the imposter syndrome can tie into this because we look at other people in different lights. So I think when you're in a romantic relationship with somebody or when you're really good friends with somebody, you kind of see yourselves on an even playing field just because you know each other really well. And when you're talking with somebody who you don't know very well, you often put more stock in, I guess, like their professional reputation or you're more concerned about how you're going to appear to them, maybe. Mm -hmm. And maybe that affects how you will take their advice versus how you'll take the advice of somebody that you're really close to. Yeah. And and by default, they're more likely to have something you didn't think of yet because their perspective will be way different. Whereas like... I know a lot of the perspective that Ashley will come with because I'm with her every day. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense. Yeah. Something I deal with is, so my, my, I think my biggest manifestation of imposter syndrome comes from the fact that I run like a productivity channel. Yeah. But then, and I know this is irrational, but I will look at musicians who get lots of stuff created like uh, Andrew Huang is a great example. He's got he's got like a video coming out every week, but then if you look at his Spotify, he's got like 20 albums of songs. Or I'll look at, you know, authors. I'm like, well, why were they able to write a book, but I haven't written another book yet? And I'm like, I'm supposed to be the productivity guy, so I should be able to put out all this content and be yeah. super productive in another field at the exact same time, not realizing that, yeah, of course, making the content, like, just because it's about productivity doesn't mean that it isn't content that requires the same, the same steps and the same amount of work. But yeah, I'll deal with that. Or when I don't have like a perfect morning routine or I'm not like perfectly going to the gym, I'm just like, well, I guess I'm a failure. I think, so I don't know if you get this, but uh, I feel less imposter syndrome from a beginner's perspective than I do uh, feel like washed up syndrome. I don't know if Mm -hmm. you get this, but like sometimes I'll put a video out and it won't do well. And I'll be like, well, that's it. I'm, I'm washed up. Like I'm, I'm past my prime. I'm no longer able to. I've definitely felt past my prime. (laughs) I feel past my prime, like all the time, physically at least Mm -hmm. because uh, after all the nerves and stuff, I'm like, I was way stronger in college, and I have I've still not been able to to rematch that mm-hmm. because stuff kept happening. But I also felt so much more productive back then, so much more organized, and that's probably because I had to organize like 17 different classes and a, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff at the same time. And now, when I don't have to balance that much, I'm like, why am I not getting more done? It should be easier, right? So what you're saying is I should give you 17 articles that are all due next week? Um, I'd probably find a way to do it. Now, I don't know that that's a good (laughs) thing because I may match it, but I will run myself into the ground in the process. Mm -hmm. But I feel feel the washed up thing a little bit with um, anything I start to lose inspiration for. Mm, Like my photos, you know, because last year I was posting, I posted one new photo every single day for like a little over six months. And that was I. That was a filtered set of photos that I liked. Like yeah. I, I kept tons of photos that I took that weren't good enough. Out of that, I took thousands of photos. And now I'm posting just a few times a week if I can. And I don't feel I'm like none of these photos are that crazy. I haven't had the time to go sit out there for like hours and mm-hmm. take one photo. 
and I don't know what to take photos of. I must have done it all already. Eh, I'm yeah. not. I'm not good at this anymore. And then, yeah, I, I feel like, especially because, um, like, with social media, I feel like this is easy because I post something, and then I won't get as many reactions to it as I did on previous ones. Yeah. But a lot of that's algorithm nonsense. Yep. And that, so that's the big, <clears throat> like, the washed up syndrome, like not, quote unquote. It's not my fault. Yeah. So, like, you know, I'll put out a video and it won't do super well. And I'm like, well, I was on a roll a few months ago and now it's. Yeah, now it's, it's gone. Not, We're dead. I guess I'm dead. And, you know, it's funny because, like, I have data to show that my channel, my blog, everything I've done, it goes in cycles. And the cycles have, like, there's different causes for them. Sometimes it's seasonality, sometimes it's just. You know, what frame of mind was I in? Was I picking good topics or not? And every time it's bounced back, but every time it starts to dip again, I'm just like, well, this is it. You know, that's my first thought. I don't want to say like I'm, I'm mired in that. I did want to, to mention something about you and your photography, though, because I, I want to say you, you mentioned that like something you posted recently wasn't your best work or something like that. I don't know. If, did I? I, maybe I can't remember, but I could see that. Or maybe you just said to me in person, like, I haven't been posting photos. I feel bad about my photos. But then this spider photo that you posted, I was like, this is one of the best things you've ever posted, in my but, opinion. But it didn't have perfect <laughs> focus exactly where I wanted the focus. It's only mostly there. The focus looks perfectly on his eyes. Yeah, but I have the... Where did you want the focus? Well, it's not perfectly on the hairs on the eyes. eyes. It's just mostly perfectly on the eyes. So it's... I I see incredibly minute improvements that could be made, (laughs) and therefore it's garbage. So yeah, you you probably like zoom in in Lightroom or something and see... Yeah, because I have all the raw photos. But... uh, well, number one, a very simple unsharp mask would help to uh, widen yeah. your depth of field a little bit. A but little I know bit. you hate processing. It's true. I don't process or develop any of them. Uh, two, on Instagram, I cannot tell. There's literally no way I can tell. It looks perfectly focused no, I, on his eyes. I will always find like a little thing about it that wasn't quite how I wanted. And then I'm like, this was, <laughs> this was sure, this was 96% of the way there. But you know what that makes it? It makes it garbage. Yeah. Yeah, I totally get it's, that. And, and it's like... It's, it's ridiculous because I take all of my photos in manual now. Mm-hmm. I'm doing like all the stuff myself with advanced technique that I could never have done in the beginning. But yeah. because it's natural to me now, I don't think about the fact that that is anything. I'm just like, well, yeah, of course I'm shooting in manual. I can't do macro without manual. The autofocus <laughs> doesn't work very well. And, and meanwhile, I need control over the shutter speed or else I won't have enough light. Duh. But it's not like I'm good at this. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's all these people who are like, I don't know how to shoot in manual. <clears throat> yeah, it's you know? just, it's like, once it becomes easy, it stops feeling like work. And I'm like, well, I, I didn't have to try. So yep. obviously everybody could do this. And that's a human fallacy, right? You assume mm-hmm. everybody else is like you a little bit. Like, yeah. And it's funny because like you, you could instantly disprove that just by asking yourself, <laughs> yeah, how do I compare to me a year ago? Because there are obviously people who are a year younger than me a year uh, less experience in the hobby. So clearly not everyone else is like this. Yeah. But yeah, you, you start to think. And I think part of it is you see a lot of super good people on social media. So it's very easy to compare yourself to them. A lot of times they're younger or there's yeah. all these things, right? Or their numbers are, are bigger. And I think like the numbers and the algorithms are a huge contributor to imposter syndrome and also washed up syndrome. Yeah, you, know, you feel like yeah, it's the algorithm. What, what am I even doing posting this? I'm mm-hmm. not good enough to post this. You know what's interesting? Um, I just switched. They have like a creator account thing, so you can get the statistics without pretending you're a business. Oh, yeah. So I did that just so I could sort of see what's going on. So I posted the College Info Geek Pixel Llama because mm-hmm. I want to start posting small amounts of pixel art. It's the most successful photo, likewise, that I've had in a long time. The next photo oh. I posted did not do nearly as well. But it's like this cool little butterfly thing. And I'm like, why does everybody hate the butterfly? I'm terrible (laughs) at photography. Wrong with the statistics. The reason is they actually have similar conversion rates. The butterfly might have a better conversion rate for uh, amount of people who like it versus see it. Mm -hmm. Because of one specific hashtag on the llama, about 2,000 people more saw that one. I don't see any hashtags on this. I put the hashtag in a comment. Oh, I forget you did the comments. But basically, the it showed me, it was like, okay, so 2% of the people that saw this butterfly were not in your audience. 
about 50% of the people that saw this llama were not in your audience. So the reason that one's so much more successful is because it brought in a different audience, mm. not because everybody hates my butterfly and I'm terrible at photography now. What was the hashtag that brought in new people? Probably a Sprite, the pixel art program I'm using. It's got about oh, a 20,000 okay. dedicated base of pixel artists. So that's my prediction. The other ones didn't seem likely to help. This is a cool hashtag. Yeah, it's a really good pixel art I'm application. I'm follow that um, hashtag because that's pretty sweet. Yeah, Ace Pride is pretty cool. You know what's funny? I think like in your imposter syndrome, you, you weirdly unlock something that many, many people struggle to do on Instagram. What? Which is to bring in outside audiences it within the app <clears throat> through hashtags. Yeah, I didn't even realize that that would ever matter. Like every but, every time I've ever used a hashtag, it just it doesn't bring in anyone. Ever. I didn't think it was going to do anything. Without these statistics, every time I would just be like, "Well, this photo is obviously terrible. I thought it was cool, but nobody likes nobody likes this damselfly. I guess everybody hates damselflies. <laughs> probably because I posted one last year. Like, it's probably not even the same people. <laughs> I posted that once before. It's probably not even the same people seen it because the algorithm. So, like, mm -hmm. the way all of the social media is, where it doesn't give you just a chronological feed, it's practically designed to make you feel like you're not actually that successful, even because yeah. your audience doesn't even get to see the stuff they followed you to see. Mm -hmm. So, I guess, like, part it's of what, crazy part of getting past this is you have to learn to build internal self confidence and enough expertise that you can critique your own work in, I guess, more objective sense that isn't so pegged yeah. to external metrics. And you got to be able to, you have to like really internalize. This is probably like a, an algorithm thing or a tech not it's, if it doesn't perform well, we should not start with the assumption that it was horrible, mm -hmm. which is the assumption I want to start with every time, because like you just pulled up that spider. And if you had asked me, was I particularly proud of any photos I've posted lately? I wouldn't even have thought of that one. Really? I really liked it at the time. <laughs> yeah, but, I think the composition of that was really nice. The, the later, you know, the farther I got from taking it, the mm -hmm. more I was like, I could have done better. <laughs> <sighs> That's what I feel about literally every piece of content I create. Oh, I could have done better. It's like the artist's the time, curse. How yeah. are you going to feel good about yourself when you get better and prove your old self bad? Yeah, when you're when you're in the process of making it, number one, you don't have the benefit of hindsight. Like, you know, whatever yeah. you made it six months ago, you have hindsight. You've had time to reflect on it. You might have been given feedback from other people. But uh, while you're making it, you don't have that. Yeah, and you're also like, well, I got to get this done eventually. I can't just work on it forever. I need to move on to the next thing. Yeah. So it's so easy. I think it's so easy for us to place great expectations on both our past selves in the form of like regret and also on our future selves just because we're not experiencing those moments right now. So it's very easy to be like, oh, well, my future self, he'll put lots and lots and lots of work into this. You know, he can sit down and just edit for 16 hours. It's fine because it's not me and it's not these 16 hours. But when you get to that point, you're just like, I don't have time for that. Yeah. You know, I only have eight hours to put into this because of all my other obligations. So it's just not going to happen. This week's episode of our show is brought to you by our friends over at Audible, which is the best place on the internet to get your hands on audiobooks. And if you've listened to this podcast at all or watched any of my videos, you will know that I am a huge fan of audiobooks. I listen to them while I'm running at the gym, while I'm going on bike rides, while I'm cooking. Anytime when I'm doing stuff that doesn't require like a huge amount of cerebral processing, I love to listen to audiobooks so I can learn at the same time or at least entertain myself. And Audible is the best place on the internet to get them because they have an absolutely unmatched library of titles. They have all the bestsellers, lots of obscure stuff, even like these great courses, things where you can learn about classical music appreciation, which I've actually listened to before. And they also have our recommendation for this week, which is going to be Leonardo da Vinci. It's a good one. And you read that one. I did uh, indeed. That's a great read or a great recommendation for this particular episode because there is a man who never felt like he had to get any kind of qualification or permission to throw himself into a field. Yep. Right? He just threw himself wherever he was interested. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, gets a lot of uh, afterlife validation from us. A lot because of apparently he was a genius. Apparently. <laughs> the video that you wrote about him actually did really, really well. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. So apparently people kind of resonated with 
the way that he did things. Also, the book is super long. This is a great audiobook recommendation. That's true, yeah, because uh, when you sign up for Audible by going over to audible.com slash CIG or texting CIG to 500-500 on your phone, you are going to activate a free 30-day trial of Audible service that comes with one free audiobook download of your choice out of their entire library. So it could be Leonardo da Vinci. And actually, you know what? I have, I have that one. I want to see how many hours it is because I know it's pretty lengthy. Uh, load my library. It's down here somewhere. Leo, where you at, my boy? 17 hours. <laughs> so yeah, 17 hours Yep. of audiobook. <coughs> completely free. And in addition to that free audiobook download with your trial, you also get two Audible originals that you cannot get anywhere else and audio workout programs, meditation programs, all kinds of health and fitness content that comes completely free. And then when you're a member every single month, you get one credit for another audiobook in their library. Again, whatever you want it to be and two more Audible originals each and every month along with that access to those health and fitness programs. And if you ever decide to quit or cancel, you get to keep your entire library of stuff you downloaded forever. So once again, if you want to get a free 30-day trial of Audible, one free audiobook download of your choosing, and two Audible originals, go over to audible.com slash CIG, and that is A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash CIG, or text CIG to 500 to 500 on your phone. Big thanks to Audible for sponsoring this week's episode and being a huge supporter of College Info Geek in general. And another thanks goes out to our second sponsor this week, which is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online library of thousands of courses that can help to boost your skills in a ton of different areas that can also boost your career prospects. They've got courses on graphic design, which I know your girlfriend has taken. There yes, are indeed. Procreate illustration courses, all kinds of cool stuff like that. Video production courses, lots of really in-depth video animation courses, which I've gone through and uh, upped my After Effects game using those. Productivity courses, including, and actually, I tasked you with it this week. So, how would you promote my course on Skillshare, good uh, sir? There's this course Tom made one time. <laughs> it's a uh, productivity master class. It's probably good. <laughs> it's, <laughs> quotes, it's probably good. Martin Bamey, 2019. There we go. You should you probably, probably put what? that like on the page somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I am going to ask them if they could put that on the page somewhere. It's probably good. So yes, I have a course called Productivity Masterclass. It goes through the entire process of creating your productivity system, your to-do list, your calendar, your note-taking system, the way that you organize your physical and digital files, and the interplay between all of those things. So if you want to improve the way that you manage your system, you may want to take that course. But I also have another recommendation this week, and that is going to be Productivity with Evernote, Use One Tool for Everything by Lindsay Holmes. So if you want to learn how to use Evernote to manage your entire life like I do, uh, then you might want to take that course. And it would be a great compliment to my course since the note-taking app that I do recommend is Evernote. Again, I've been using it for probably about a decade at this point. Can't really use anything else for my note-taking and, and document and information capture purposes. So definitely check that out. And of course, when you're a member on Skillshare, you get access to the entire library. So there is a ton you can learn. And the best part is that while Skillshare is incredibly affordable, once you start paying for it, you can go over to Skillshare.com slash geek and get a two month free trial. Once again, Skillshare.com slash geek, sign up, you get two months of completely unlimited access to their library. And there is a heck of a lot you can learn in two months. So go learn some skills, Skillshare.com slash geek. And thank you again to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back into it. Uh, so I wanna talk about something that I experienced yesterday. Uh, I put up a video and I wasn't sure if the video would do super well, but I was like, maybe it'll be cool. I came up with what I thought was a good title, put the video up and the YouTube dashboard now has this awful feature, which I cannot stop looking at. Oh no. It used to not have this. It has this little box that uh, after about an hour of a video going up, it will tell you, Here's the estimated views, watch time, and uh, watch time percentage. And your ranking <clears throat> of this video compared with the last 10 you did. Oh. So, whereas I used to just put up a YouTube video and let it do its thing and be like, you know, some videos are gonna be slow burners. You know, like the, the multiple choice video. That video did not do super well when it came out. 
and now it's the fourth or fifth most popular video on the channel. And it's like 3 million views. Um, and when it went up, I didn't care. I was like, I'm just putting content on the world. I'm gonna let it do its thing, whatever. But now, now within one hour of uploading, you can go into your dashboard and be like, oh yeah, ranking by views, 10 out of your last 10. So it's just like this <laughs> big, like you're a failure box. You know, and when, when you're riding high, like with that morning routine video we put up, it's like one out of 10, it's doing amazing. It's like, great job, your video is taking off and you feel good, right? But the flip side is there, eventually a video is gonna be 10 out of 10. Yeah. You know, unless literally every video you make is better than the last one in terms of views and show me a creator who can do that and I will show you elephants flying because there isn't one. You know, even Mr. Beast has variation. Like more, every one of his videos gets over 10 million views, but there's still variation there. <laughs> it's not like a constant upward trend. So, you know, at least 50% of the time, you're gonna log in and you're gonna see six out of 10 through 10 out of 10, and you're gonna feel bad. For a while, I had the self-discipline to hide that box using CSS. But uh, recently I've brought it back why I brought it back that? because the channel was riding high in August and I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. But now, of course, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, so I was I was feeling down, you know, immediately upon seeing that stupid 10 out of 10 thing, I got like a wave of the washed out syndrome. Like, oh, yep, I guess, uh, you know, even though I had made that, that comeback, that was just temporary. I'm gonna fail. You know, all these feelings of anxiety came back. And then... I decided to go to the gym and just do a hard workout. And I found it really interesting in the middle of that workout, like as I was bench pressing or whatever, those feelings really diminished. And I just started getting <clears throat> more confidence back and I started getting ideas for how I could improve things. And that's when I started messaging you about like, here's what oh, we can yeah. do to improve the business. So I went from a position of, just basically wallowing in anxiety and and feelings of self pity to feeling more determined instead. And you know, I don't I don't know if there's like a scientific basis behind this, but here's your n equals one. You know, I could have sat there and just like watched TV or just continued working, and I probably would have felt bad. But I I honestly believe that because I went out and got some physical exercise, that affected my mood. That would make sense to me. I mean, I feel pretty good after when I do work out, which I haven't in a while, so I feel terrible. <laughs> but so yeah, maybe maybe that's you know one way to deal with these feelings when they are happening in the moment. I don't think that it's like it, obviously it's not a permanent fix. No, it's not a philosophy that's going to help you move past them, but it's going to diminish the anxiety that they create in the moment. That's my belief. Yeah, I don't have a scientific at study the very least to it could here, distract you long enough, I, maybe. Yeah, but I honestly believe like when you are when you are working out, when you are physically exerting yourself, you are putting your body and your brain in a state that is different than when you're at rest. You know, you're releasing good endorphins. Um, there's all these benefits that you can go read about. Like John Rady has a really good book called Spark, which is all about exercise and the brain, how they kind of <clears throat> affect each other. And there's all these scientific studies that have shown how exercise can reduce anxiety, reduce stress, yeah. like help all these things. So it would make sense that it would absolutely affect your self-confidence and how you feel about maybe a recent failure or, you know, quote, I put, I'm going to put failure in quotes because is it actually a failure? You know, maybe the algorithm didn't like it, but I still think it's a good video. Well, I think, see, failure doesn't really make any sense because the way that I know both of us tend to work on our creations because we talked about this a billion times and uh, I've tried it the other way and it doesn't work for me, but make a whole bunch of stuff and eventually you start making your best stuff. Yeah. I had to post a photo every day for like six months and now I feel like I like, I feel like photography is easy now, but five years ago me would be like, how are you even taking that? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. I don't, I use, I don't understand how to do that at this point. I don't even know what, what you're talking about. Yeah. But in order to do the, I'm going to keep throwing everything at the wall and wait till something sticks and I start to find my sort of niche area where I'm good at it, you have to do like 90% of the things that weren't your best niche area that in order to get to the part where I was good at art, I had to do tons of art that wasn't my best. Yeah. It can't all be my best. 
that's just not going to happen. So mm. I'm going to feel like a failure most of the time comparing it to my best. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you even avoid that? Unless specifically I make one art today and then tomorrow I top it and then tomorrow I top it and then the next day I top that and I, and I always improve every day until I die. Mm-hmm. There are, which is just horribly unlikely. Most of the time, my art will not beat my best. Every once in a while it will. Yep. But most of the time it will be mediocre compared. But anybody who's like, whoa, I really like what that person does, they're thinking about your best work probably, but you're too focused on, yeah, but the one I posted after that was only 90% good. <laughs> and 90% is a failure. That's a that's a F. Yeah. I remember in the early days <clears> of my <throat> channel, I put out like these two videos that were bangers. Like One was like eight advanced study tips that did well. And it was like study less, study smart that did well. And then uh, I think very around the same time, I put out the equal odds rule video, which is yeah. literally what you're just talking yeah, about. Yeah, the equal odds rule. That video just bombed. Like it's one of the worst performing videos I've ever created on the channel. But, and this is something that I want to bring up. I have had multiple people tell me that is their favorite video I've ever made. See, Even though it's this- one of the worst performing. Um, you know, to give you another example, like the Notion video we put up. Uh, that video in terms of performance for like people getting to the end of the video and watching the sponsor segment, didn't do super hot. So, you know, my brain is likely to fix it and I'd be like, oh, that video's a failure, but it's a success in other ways because it taught people's like super advanced techniques in this in this program that they've been really wanting. Like I gave people what they wanted. Yeah. It's a success in that way. So you have to ask yourself like, well, in what dimensions did I succeed? Yeah, I feel like the... That whole washed up thing, that's a really big part of imposter syndrome eventually because it's mm-hmm. just, you end up attributing all your previous successes to like luck or something. Yeah. Or you feel like, uh, you feel like you have to remain beholden to who you used to be, which I know is a huge that, problem for I have you. I that problem a lot. I'm still trying to maintain. You know, you had, I remember you had goals that you had set when we were in our teenage years. Because when did I meet you? When we were like 19? Something like that. Yeah. And you were like, I want to be a polyglot and I want to learn like 17 million languages and all these things. And then over the course of the next few years, like you had new goals and focuses, but you still felt guilty that you uh, weren't focusing of, on the old I have a lot of things. problems getting, well, also because of the internet, right? So mm-hmm. I feel like because I had a language blog at the time, I wasn't allowed yep. to stop that or I would be even more of a fraud. And I still feel imposter syndrome with the language thing because I'm rusty in like all of them mm-hmm. right now. I haven't had time to focus on it. This year has been a mess, too busy doing other stuff. So now I'm like, am I an an imposter if I'm not at all times at the top of my game in three (laughs) languages while simultaneously... I have too many interests to remain Mm -hmm. even close to A-level in all of them at once. I can't. I can't. Yep. That's not how it works. And I know that's not how it works because essentialism is like my favorite nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about this stuff all the time and it just... It doesn't really matter i'm still gonna have those feelings every once in a while because i've tried to be good at too many things so i have too many things to become worse at yeah so one thing i've noticed about imposter syndrome is it can be domain specific because weirdly i never felt very much imposter syndrome when it came to making youtube videos Hmm. i never really felt it when it came to blogging I never really felt it when it came to general career things when I was in college, like working my way up to a a career in IT, didn't feel imposter syndrome at all. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but there was just like this natural feeling that I'm just working my way up towards being a professional and I'm not there yet. And with YouTube specifically, you know, I'd read the Nick Winter book, The Motivation Hacker, where he was talking about, you know, how you have to work as a professional, the whole amateurs get inspired and then they work professionals show up and they work at the same time every day and i embrace that and i just said okay i'm going to put out videos um once a week and i'm going to try to make a one percent improvement in some dimension each time but that's it they've got to go out but with music i have tremendous imposter syndrome (laughs) and i don't know what it is i wonder if it's the fact that music is art and it feels more ethereal. It feels like there's less of a process to it and more of just like, you gotta be a genius in an artistic sense and it will just flow out of your fingers and I just don't have that. Whereas 
video, especially mm. making videos about productivity, seems pretty straightforward. You yeah. Know, you research the procrastination equation. You write a script, just like a book report. They taught me how to do that in school. And then you sit in front of the camera and you do the lines and you edit it. It's all very logical. I can do that. And it might not be perfect, but I can do it. Whereas like, I'll sit down and be like, I want to make a song. I have a riff idea. Okay, I have no idea how to turn that into a beautiful, full-fledged song. I guess I'm just not cut out for that. I'm an imposter. Yeah. And you know, it turns out like, if you talk to musicians, they will tell you that, you know, there is a lot of creativity involved in it, but it's also really a lot like the process of making a video or the process of doing your homework. Like, all right, we have a riff. Now we need to build that into a loop. Okay, let's add a really simple drum beat. We might not use these drums in the end, but we're just going to have it there. And literally last night, I forced myself to do this. I went, I like watched along with somebody as he was making a beat. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we started out with a piano thing. I'll do that. All right, this sounds okay. Okay, so now he's adding a bass line. All right, well, I'll do that. Oh, this is sound a little better. Okay, now he's adding drums. Okay, I really don't know how to use the drum plugin on my computer. So I'm just going to load it up and I'm going to use nothing but like a hi-hat, a kick, and a snare. Just that. And by the end of the night, I had something that was like actually pretty nice sounding but before that experience with music it's always been like true musicians are able to just like i don't know fart out a complete song and i can't do that so i'm an imposter and i feel like even more of an imposter because i've bought guitars and a piano and like i have all this gear but i haven't made a hit song yet what's the problem tom yeah, you, you have put, all the tools. You throw There's a piano you, right you, there. You put money right at it. How come it didn't fix it all? Yeah, how come how come buying the gear didn't <clears> fix it? You know, it turns out that you looked at the art, or I looked at the art as like this impenetrable thing that you have to be some sort of creative genius from birth to be able to do. When in fact, it is something that is very similar to the other things I've learned how to do. I yeah. just I didn't give it the time. No, I, I mean. I think that makes sense with, with especially with the music because you probably you you care more about it maybe in a creative sense because it's so hard to measure. Mm-hmm. And I know with with piano especially for me, I have actually this probably applies to everything. I have tremendously high expectations of myself, and you know the the better that I get at something, the higher my expectations will be because I'll have better yeah. taste. Yep. I'll understand even like like the photos. The better I get, the more I understand of tiny little things that could have made it better and mm-hmm. my higher my expectations get. And I assume that everybody else, all any listeners, all of my friends, anybody who's ever even known once that I was interested in one of these things, I assume they all have the exact same expectations of me. And then I'm a failure <laughs> if if I'm not world class at like everything at once, which I know is impossible. So yeah. therefore I'm stuck feeling like, oh God. And, you, and yet you, you tell yourself this is impossible, but it's my expectation of myself. But I'm still, I still so have to do it. So then you're paralyzed. Yeah. And you don't, you don't make the next thing because the next thing can't live up to your expectations. Yeah, it's and really... So you, just, you stay feeling like an imposter. Yeah, I didn't even feel good about my, like, notebook productivity system over the summer because, like, uh, mm-hmm. I remember Ransom was writing an article and he was like, hey, I, uh, I remember you mentioned you were doing this. Uh, you, like, sent a picture or something for the thing? And I was like, it's not ready yet. I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> because over the summer, I had a lot of stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, my car got totaled. There's carpet beetles in my new place. Uh, I had a loss in my family. So I hadn't been doing all the productive thing. I had too many X's in those boxes making me feel bad. And I was like, this system just makes me look like a failure. I can't show it to anyone. Yeah. Clearly, I've had a lot of extenuating circumstances. But that didn't matter be- yep. because I'm not going to forgive myself. That would be ridiculous. Yeah, and the funny thing is, like, once people see that system, they're probably going to think it's amazing. Yeah, I really like the they're system like, now that great. I'm feeling better about it. It's like I've been using it for, like, a year, longer than anything else. But I was still, like, but I didn't have, like, a perfect two weeks. That Why have I not perfected everything every day? Why have I been failing? Yep. Well, things have been going on that are perfectly understandable. That doesn't mean anything because you're supposed to be better than this. <laughs> yeah. You're the chosen one. I guess we all feel like we're the chosen one. All right, so yeah. uh, Harvard Business Review had this article on overcoming imposter syndrome, which I will put in the show notes. Okay. But they listed uh, four of like the common, I guess, things we tell ourselves when we feel imposter syndrome. And I kind of wanted to go through each of them and just sort of see if we feel these things 
or if we have ways of overcoming them. Uh, so the first one is I must not fail. There can be a huge amount of pressure currently not to fail in order to <clears throat> avoid being found out. Paradoxically, success also becomes an issue as it brings the added pressure of responsibility and visibility. This leads to an inability to enjoy success. And I think that that's a big thing, like the washed out thing. Yeah. The more successful you get, it literally... And I remember feeling this, so I, I bet you a lot of people listening to this feel this right now, uh, this feeling that if I could just get to the next level, it would be easy. When I was a beginning YouTuber, I was like, I bet you when I'm in a million subscribers, I'm gonna have everything so dialed in, it's gonna be so easy. You know, I'll have made so many videos, it's gonna be super easy to write one, it's gonna be super easy to film it, it's always gonna do well, it's gonna be a place of bliss. And that's not how it works. <laughs> Making no, videos have, was have way never. easier when I was a beginner because <clears throat> I had no expectations for them. I was like, I would like to get to a thousand subscribers someday, but it's probably not going to happen. You know, how many people get there? Very few. So I'm just going to make things and throw them out. Now, it's now to the point where it's not even about like the end of the overall performance of the channel and its growth. It's now like every single video feels like it has to be a hit. Yeah. So the pressure is worse. And we're constantly like, we're totally going to get ahead. We're going to get ahead. And then we just said that for years and we can't do it because <laughs> as we keep trying to get ahead, everything keeps getting higher quality. Mm -hmm. We've upgraded like several times. Yep. And we're still just like, that doesn't matter. We're going to get ahead somehow mm -hmm. and it's all going to magically fit into place. Yeah. Or people. And when it doesn't. People start coming up and, you know, what they're doing is maybe better in a certain dimension than what you're doing. And you're like, well, I'm at this level. I have to match yeah. that too, you know? Yeah. So I think I think a fix to that is to think about the overall body of work you're building, not necessarily the individual piece of working that you're working on right now. Like not everything has to be a hit. So I try to keep that equal odds rule in mind. Yeah, which I should probably explain it for people who haven't heard about us uh, or haven't heard us talk about it. It's this idea that the, uh, or I guess it's not an idea, it's an actual observation. The scientists who publish the papers that get cited the most often, so in other words, the most successful research, just so happen to be the scientists that publish the most papers. So they have the best, but they also have a lot of mediocre stuff and possibly some of the worst stuff. Yeah, probably not like terrible stuff, but they just have a big body of work. And then maybe, you know, the top 10% represents the group of research that gets cited all the time, you know? Yeah, like they didn't sit around and wait to make one perfect thing mm -hmm. and then get all disappointed when it didn't perform well. They just did lots of stuff all the time. And yeah, eventually some of them performed really well. Like I bet you if we brought up Martin <coughs> Seligman's CV... It would be huge. Hey, Jamie, pull that up. Oh, wait, we don't have a Jamie. Oh, no. Dang it. <laughs> but yeah, like, I would bet, and maybe I'm wrong, but I would bet that he has more papers than just those few that everyone keeps talking about. Yeah, and probably. He, what was, he was the um, learned helplessness guy, right? Yeah. I think, because, yeah, so. that was, like, one of the very first episodes so. that you were on. Yeah, I read the whole In terms of, like, whole being book about a co-host. But uh, that's... This, this is pretty much the thing I have to deal with with the photography, and yeah, I fix it with the equal odds rule, sort of. It bec To me, I have to make it more about, did I successfully post three photos this week mm -hmm. on the schedule I have allotted? If so, I don't care how they did, because I have to not pay attention to that number. The number I'm paying attention to is, did I do it at all? I have to feel good about the action and not the results, and that's yeah. really hard to do, mm -hmm. but it's like the only way to make it happen if i'm just gonna wait and i won't post any photos until i have the best photo i've ever seen i'm just gonna post it the algorithm's gonna hide it because i haven't been posting for a while it'll look like it failed and yeah. then i will have gained nothing yep so. is there anything that you <clears throat> know you can do to make yourself feel better about the action of posting i well i mean i have it in my little notebook thing so i get a, okay like i get a track that i did it each time i feel good when i'm consistent mm-hmm and I think that's, I feel like it, it makes me feel like I have control over something. Like mm -hmm. I, I can control that I at least am good enough at this, that I did my work on time. Yeah. You know, and I got it ready. As far as the which photos will be popular, 
kind of random, seemingly. I I mean, that spider didn't even do as well as the Pixelama just did, even though that spider probably, it's, that's a, I think it's a decently good photo, probably. Mm-hmm. I can't even not equivocate that right now. Though, but you also put a lot of effort into the Pixelama. I did. I think you did it a I'm long a, time ago. I'm a so very feel... amateur pixel artist, though. That's the first thing I've really done. Yeah. And then... Uh, I also think that there's a big element of people following you for you oh, yeah, and yeah, getting yeah. excited about you doing a new thing. Yeah, but see, the thing there is, like, the arguably... The work that took me more time to eventually be able to do... Mm-hmm didn't really perform nearly as well as some rather random other posts. Yeah. So I just got to ignore that. I just got to do it on the schedule and say this is what matters. What matters is not the output of getting likes or whatever. The results, I have to ignore them. Yeah. It's got to be the input. Did I put in the time? And if so, I can feel like I'm a photographer Mm -hmm. because I photograph. I think that's the big thing. I'm a photographer because I photograph. Not because... A thousand people liked my photo or because I got my photo in a show somewhere. Oh, yeah. I don't even feel cool about that anymore. And I got my photos on a wall and I just don't care. Mm -hmm. It's like, eh, yeah, they probably chose them because they didn't get a lot of entrance. Yeah. (laughs) I'm a photographer because I I, I take photos. Make it about the action. Yes. I'm a musician because I make songs. Not the results. Do you do this? Is it a part of your identity? Then you can start to maybe feel good about it. But the results, that's... (laughs) It's basically random. I can't predict what other people like. I can do a little bit of a degree, but like, you know, some of the videos you work hardest on, sometimes it'll work. And sometimes you'll just be like, oh, nobody cared? Well, but I thought that was the best one. You just, I'm not even going to try to predict that anymore. So here's something uh, with regard to the external metrics. Um, There's a band. I don't think that they are active anymore because, boy, the, the release that I listened to was from 1991. But it's called the band's called Devil Doll. I have no clue how I came across this because it's like this really obscure Romanian band led by some guy who is only known as Mr. Doctor. Nobody knows his real identity. It's like the most hipster obscure thing You've ever. You've been pulled into a cult. It's kind of culty. Uh, they literally have an album that the guy composed it. He hired like professional studio musicians. He hired a full orchestra. It's like a whole giant production. He made it, never distributed it. Really? Yep. Apparently he has the master and has just never shared it. That guy is a musician. And if you go listen to, I think my, my favorite album they've done is uh, it's called the girl who was death. And if anyone ever goes and listens to this, you have to prepare yourself for his voice because he doesn't sing. He uses this weird German, like guttural scream sing technique that is absolutely awful to listen to. It's horrible, but there are extended instrumental sections between his disgusting sing talk thing that are amazing. Then there's like, I think it's like six minutes into the song. There's like this violin piece. It's just, I love it so much, but almost no one has heard of that band or I guess group. Maybe it's just him. And then people he hires, I don't know who or what it is, but they are undoubtedly musicians with a ton of talent that I will yeah. probably never reach. And yet my stupid guitar song on Spotify probably has more plays. Yeah. Musicians because they put in the work. Yes. Not because they because were recognized music. as musicians by someone else, mm-hmm. but because doing the work th- that is enough by itself. You don't need somebody else to validate that you are this if yep. you do the work. And I'm sure Mr. Doctor in his ridiculous standards for himself must feel like <clears throat> his albums are somehow a failure in some way. But in terms of external reception, because he never chose to release that first one, there's no failure there. Yeah. There's no way to say, like, oh, you know, a million people didn't listen to this, so it's a failure. You never released it. So that metric doesn't even matter. And if that metric doesn't matter for him, and yet you can clearly say he is a musician, then that metric should not matter for you to decide whether or not you are a musician either. Yeah. It is, did I make music? Yeah, there's just so much arbitrary stuff when it comes to whether you're going to get feedback from stuff that you want or in large numbers or who becomes a famous rapper and who doesn't. Mm-hmm. There, there's, you know, so many different things just involve a little bit of luck in life. Yeah. So it's got to be about the work. Absolutely. You just got to put in the work. All right. So the second one, 
I feel like a fake. Imposters believe they do not deserve success or professional accolades and feel that somehow others have been deceived into thinking otherwise. This goes hand in hand with the fear of being found out, discovered, or unmasked. They believe they give the impression that they are more competent than they are and have deep feelings that they lack knowledge or expertise. Often they believe they don't deserve a position or a promotion and are anxious that somebody made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, I feel this at every job. Yeah. All the time. I felt this managing hundreds of servers. And that's not even what they hired you for. It's not even what I was hired for originally, but I was just like, well, we also had a time. We had to plot our time into this little thing to mm -hmm. mark what we were doing all day. And we had to mark it as billable or non-billable. And I didn't really work with clients most of the time other than fixing things that we couldn't bill for. So almost all of my time was non-billable. And I'd mm -hmm. be like maintaining half the company, fixing all the servers, doing all the stuff. But because it wasn't me building something new for a client, I was always non-billable. And I was like, oh, I'm so bad at this job. I never make this company <laughs> any money. I only protect all of it. Yeah, you I, only protect them from utterly going down. But flames, like there's, but... No, there's no measurement. Yeah. There, you know, what am I going to do? Bring all the servers down just so I can bring them up and say, look, I did it. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, I felt pretty bad at that job, even though I was, I feel like I was doing like a good job at the actual tasks, but I didn't feel good about it on a daily basis. Yeah. I feel this about the foundations of my entire career. Yeah. Because some through some weird set of circumstances i somehow stumbled into a career where you know not just me like you and i and everyone who works for this company as our profession we kind of give people advice on how to work how to study how to live in some cases and uh sometimes i'll get comments from people who are like what qualifies you to talk about this or there was there was there was a reddit thread Somebody posted my Notion video in the Notion subreddit. Oh, yeah? And none of the comments had anything to do with the content of the video. Nobody was talking about my Notion setup. They were all talking about me. Like, there was a comment like, you know, I've seen this Thomas Frank guy on, on YouTube a couple of times. Like, what does he do? And someone explained it like, you know, he has this whole business where he's putting out YouTube videos about self-improvement, productivity, study skills. There's a website, there's a podcast, and that's how he makes all his money. And <clears> somebody <throat> replied to that with just the word, um, like clearly a negative connotation, you know? And I'm like, there's a part of me that's like, yeah, we, you know, how come I can't po like point to some illustrious, uh, you know, previous career that, uh, that gives some sort of, I don't know, like tangible basis for all this stuff. And we're, it's patently ridiculous, right? Because we know that a lot of what we do is based on actual research, scientific research. A yeah, lot of like read entire books to do this. You know, or like to get content out to to produce professional video requires a lot of domain-specific knowledge, requires a lot of uh, work as a practitioner where yeah. we can take our experiences in, I guess, like the meta of producing what we produce and use that as the experience that we draw upon. But people don't see that. People are just like, where's where's his other successful <clears throat> business? Or where's the career, you know? And I didn't do that. You know, most people who get into online business, they had a career beforehand. Like and Pat I mean, Flynn worked as an architect first. Well, and what is, what is I Pat just got Flynn into being an architect early. have to do with anything? Nothing. With what he's <laughs> that means nothing for his ability to tell you how to do these other things. Yep. It's just third party validation. Exactly. As a culture, we have certain signifiers that we have all, I guess, collectively decided, sometimes unconsciously, are more valid than others. And a lot of times those signifiers are uh, degrees from prestigious universities, which, how did they get prestigious? Oh yeah, equal odds rule. There are a few brilliant people who came through them, um, may not have even been molded much by the universities, possibly, but they could have also been geniuses. Yeah, maybe already, they would have succeeded anywhere. And they contributed lots of research and prestige, got grant money for the universities, and then the university as a gigantic uh, entity gains prestige, which then confers upon anybody who goes to it. Does it make sense? Is it any more valid than somebody who learned how to do things on their own and produce things independently? When you think about it rationally, no. But we as a species tend to put more stock in institutions that people have already put a lot of stock into. It's like yeah. the bandwagon effect, right? 
So we're like, oh, hey, he's from that big university. That means he probably is an expert. Or it's like the branding. He worked for this big corporation. That means he's probably a big expert. This person over here just built a thing on their own. You know, we don't consider the fact that maybe they worked harder, that they had to learn a greater, uh, you know, a greater amount of skills because they weren't able to just be plugged into a specialized role. And that's not to invalidate what people who work for bigger um, organizations do, but we can't just be like, that's automatically more credible than that because we're just taking the credibility that we automatically assign to the big institution yeah. and placing it on that person. Yeah, it's a ju- judge the work by the work because, mm-hmm. like, really, I know Pat, when I think of Pat Flynn, I think, oh, he's he's got some stuff about uh, websites, how to start a blog, how to start a podcast, how to do that. Never, I didn't even know he was an architect. Yep. That's not what I know him for. So his architectural career has nothing to do with anything. It's just third yeah. party validation, meaning, yeah, he did stuff and was successful before this. Yeah, and in terms of like validation for for him as an expert, like he did sell the Green Exam Academy uh, architecture study guide on a blog and made money, and that's sort of like there's my credibility for yeah, why there's I like an indirect connection. But I don't even need that. You know, when I started following him, I did not know about the Green Exam Academy stuff. What I did know is that hey, this guy has a really really high quality tutorial on how to start a podcast. I followed it and it worked. Yeah. So. Therefore, he is qualified to teach me how to start a podcast because I got the results that his yeah, content Yeah, because you looked at the work first before you decided whether or not, like, mm-hmm. well, before I try this, is this person really qualified to tell me what I'm, yeah, what they're telling me? I don't know. But if you try it and you're like, well, actually, this works, they're, they're correct, mm-hmm. you'll find out they're qualified. But did you give them a chance to begin with? I don't know. If yeah. you just type, um, maybe you're not giving them a chance <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> you know and and i get that's hard you can't give everybody a chance there are too many people there are too many people you can't literally the, yeah. invest time into every single possible creator to see if they're all qualified for whatever they're doing and to give that person the benefit of the doubt maybe they were saying um <clears throat> as in um that's awesome and they just forgot to type that i don't know maybe but also to be serious here there are a lot of people on the internet who don't put a lot of effort into validating what they are saying Oh, well, I mean, I feel pretty cynically about a lot of internet creators, so mm-hmm. I fully understand where they're coming from. I think we make a good faith attempt to either draw upon real personal experience for what we talk about or to do the research. And you know what? Here's another imposter syndrome thing. I'll read studies like, they did this uh, this big review of the last 10 years of you know highly profiled psychological research, and turns out that uh, 80% of those uh, the studies could not be replicated. Oh no! So it's like okay, so a lot of academic research is also a sham. So can yeah. I even draw upon that? <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, I've I've I know I've said it before in some context, but basically adults just pretend they know what they're doing. Nobody really knows a whole lot more than everybody else. We might have some niche knowledge on some stuff, mm-hmm. but usually we're not like mystic genius level qualified on anything. We just cobble our way through yeah. with a combination of things that happen to work well enough to help us move forward. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, you know, 10 years later, you're like, huh, it worked, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's weird, but I couldn't have necessarily predicted that it would have worked. <laughs> it's only in hindsight that you see that it did. Yeah. So I was in New York recently, and uh, I went to a recording studio uh, studio where my friend Dave, who's also the guy who manages all of our sponsorships, was doing some uh, vocal takes for his new album he's working on with his band. And we were just kind of sitting around, like, talking. And he got to talking about, like, the imposter syndrome thing. And something he said really stuck with me. He said, if you just start saying you are something, then people start to kind of believe it. As long as there's not like a huge gap between what you say and what you actually do. So if you're just like, yeah, I'm a musician, but you never put out music, then people are going to be like, yeah, you're just all talk, you know, no walk. But if you're putting out music, even if it's not great in your eyes, but you're like, ah, yeah, I'm a musician. People are going to be like, oh, yeah, he's a musician. You know, He's a YouTuber because you say it. And he was saying this because he's like, I get a lot of people who are constantly messaging me saying, like, I feel like a fraud. I feel like I don't deserve all the success. What's going on? And he's like, dude, if you keep talking about that, like, people are going to start believing that. 
that you don't deserve it, Ooh. that you don't belong because you're the one saying it. So don't outsource your self-esteem to me or anyone else because they're not going to to manage it for you. You have to deal with it yourself. Well, that's an interesting he, point. You could bring yourself down and become a fraud because yeah. you'd... It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. If you constantly down-talk yourself, if you're just like, I don't belong, then eventually people are going to be like, yeah, I guess he doesn't. You know? What if you, if you flip that and you're like, this is what I am, this is what I do, and then you're, you keep doing it, even <laughs> if the results are not up to your expectations, people are going to see what you say, see that you're putting out work, and say, okay, that's his identity, you know? Yeah, like uh, there's a really good Vonnegut quote that I like. It's, uh, I might, par- I'm, let me paraphrase it. I might have one word wrong, and I don't want to look it up right now, but we are what we pretend to be. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So we must be careful what we pretend to be in the context of that book. But in general, just <laughs> who we present ourselves as is is who we are. It's like, what? where is the secret person that's, what people see and how I express myself are going to be who I am. There isn't like a secret hidden Martin that mm-hmm. hated all those things because how else can anybody else judge or know me? Yeah, exactly. They they can't. And I mean, that's a good point about not, don't go out there and just be like, yeah, I'm real bad at this, guys, but here's this new thing I posted. It's not great. I'm going to talk myself down over and over. Yeah. Those thoughts happen, but probably be careful not to brand yourself with them. I didn't even think about that. And what's the expectation you're setting for your audience if you are downplaying your work? Yeah, because the next person will be confident. So who are are you going to go to? And you don't want to say, what I've created is literally the best song that's ever been made. Bach, Beethoven, morons. Everything that they've done, absolutely childlike in comparison to what I've created. You don't want to be like that because again, now you're cocky, you look bad because people don't like overly uh, arrogant and cocky people, but they also don't like people who are constantly, you know, overly self-deprecating. Cause number one, people yeah. feel like this guilt, like, oh, well, now I have to talk them up. Now, now I have to, to make support them, them. Are they like fishing for compliments yeah. or something? Like I, I'm not here to make them feel better today. Yeah, so again, if you want to be seen as a professional, if you want to be seen as the thing you wish to be, don't outsource your self-worth and your self-esteem and your identity to someone else to prop up for you. It's your job. And you might not feel like it's real when you say it, but eventually one day you're going to wake up and it's going to feel real because you've worked long enough. Yeah, and some people, maybe they won't agree. They'll think you're... They they won't think you're qualified. They Mm -hmm. won't like your work, but... It's just like with all the other feedback, you gotta. Yeah. Eh, some people aren't gonna like it. Whatever. Yeah, like those few people. It's who It's not think about that the feedback. There's those few people who are gonna say our business is a sham because we give advice as our profession and we didn't build a gigantic business or go to Harvard or whatever. But you know what? There's a lot more people who write us emails saying, "Hey, I followed this video and my grades are." Uh, yeah, and, it's, better and it succeeded. Semester. Like, we put a lot mm-hmm. of thought into to this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't want to talk myself up too much. They did the work. But we were able to assemble the information, the techniques, the practices that are proven to work. And there's an example of it. Yeah. You know? Um, so here's another one. It's all down to luck. The tendency to attribute success to luck or to other external reasons and not their abilities is a clear indicator of imposter syndrome. They may typically say or think, I just got lucky, or it was a fluke. Often this masks the fear that they will not be able to succeed the next time. Mm, This is a big one. Yeah, a lot of times people, if it's a failure, they'll be like, yeah, I didn't work hard enough, or I just didn't EQ the snares enough, man. People didn't like it. But then if it does well, they're like, "Uh, I don't know. I guess it just was a fluke. It certainly wasn't because I poured my heart and soul into this piece of art and worked really hard and practiced a lot. Yeah. You know? It's like... So my thing with luck is uh, it's like luck favors the prepared. Yeah. And it's the prepared in terms of like, you know, being prepared to take advantage of any kind of lucky break in the moment, but also having put in the work in the past to get yourself into a position where you can be lucky. Yeah, yeah. You can't just, luck isn't going to happen if you're just like sitting at home watching Netflix all day saying, well, I don't, I don't really need to do this particular thing because success in the music industry is all luck or Mm -hmm. it's all connections. So I'm just going to sit here. The way you get those connections is by being prepared. You're, you're into the music world. You're doing good music. Yep. One day you luckily run into somebody 
that has a connection that was going to be the perfect connection. That's the door opening because of luck. But can you keep the door open? That completely depends on whether you were prepared. If, or would that door have even opened? Like, if I want to be a musician, but I <clears> never make any music, and then I meet a producer, we could have a nice conversation at a bar or something. But then if they're like, you know, what have you done? And I have nothing to show, then yeah. they're not going to want to do anything with me. But if I'm like, yeah, I've been yeah. making music for like two years. Here's my favorite track. And they're like, oh, this is dope. Let me hook you up with a producer or something like that. Yeah. You know, that's a lucky break. And the person with imposter syndrome, myself included, is probably going to be like, uh, it was a total lucky break that I ran into that person. You know, anybody else could be better than me, but they just didn't happen to run into that person, which is true. But if I had run into that person without having had that body of work behind me, it would have meant nothing. It wouldn't have been a lucky break. It would have been it was just it was lucky to run into them, but you couldn't take advantage of the luck, so it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think of like any successful career is going to have certain catalysts that kind of catapult you forward. And I didn't mean to use two words with the same beginning syllable. Yeah. But it's still, <laughs> there's a point there. Uh, there's going to be like catalyst moments, like when my hanging desk article got picked up by Lifehacker and that kind of put my blog on the map. Seemingly random in retrospect. Seemingly random. But yep. very important. Um, or, you know, my friend my friend Patrick, his channel, TierZoo, like took off and, and now it's at like 1.6 million subscribers. Turns out that was his fourth YouTube channel. Oh. The other three never really gained any traction, but they were experienced. And they gave him the skills and the ability to produce something that was able to get a lucky break. And, you know, you can say, like, oh, that lucky break could have happened before, but he has three YouTube channels worth of it didn't until now. Had to put in the work. So put in the work, be prepared, and luck may favor you. Uh, but then, you know, acknowledge the role of luck, but don't downplay your own abilities. And if you're going to acknowledge the role of luck in good things, acknowledge it in the role of bad things, too. Yeah, that, it's know? not fair to say I, I failed, and when I succeeded, I was lucky, yeah. Although yeah. I've done that, but... I don't know what videos are going to do well and what aren't. You know, some videos don't do well, and I, I usually will be like, well, I didn't pick a good topic. But when I pick a good topic, I mean, I'm not usually like, yeah, I picked a great topic and I knew it would do well. It's usually like, well, dang, <laughs> I didn't expect that. That's lucky. Yeah. You know, why don't I flip the script? Why Why don't I feel like every time a video does well, I'm like, yes, I was super observant of the trends and so smart and I picked the right topic. And when a bad video comes out, I'm just like, well, I got unlucky. Yeah. Wrong time. Although in that case, it could be too, it could be dangerous if you dismiss too much as bad luck. Yeah. It's like a balance on each side, right? There's some luck and there's also some elements I could have controlled. Did I put out a video on, uh, you know, proper pool maintenance in December? I probably shouldn't have done that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or maybe I should have, maybe it doesn't matter. But if I'm looking for like immediate results, that's probably not the best topic to pick for that month. You know, or if I'm going to put out a video on final exams, I probably shouldn't put it out January 5th. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> right after you, I just got my grades. Nice. Yeah. Hey, guys, I got some final exam tips for you. You know, it's too late. In, in like four months, <laughs> you can use these. Okay, uh, here's the last one. Success is no big deal. The tendency to downplay success and discount it is marked in those with imposter syndrome. They might attribute their success to it being an easy task or having support and often have a hard time accepting compliments. Again, they think their success is down to luck, good timing, or having fooled others. Yeah. yeah. And that you, I think you mentioned that like at the beginning of the episode where you get to a certain level in photography where now you've learned the techniques to the point where they feel like second nature. Uh, you know, the, the interplay between ISO and shutter speed, the interplay between your, yeah, your I aperture, don't even, I don't even think about things. it. I just kind of do it you just, magically no. with my fingers. So and you get a that photo easy. that is properly exposed and you're like, anyone could do that. A chimpanzee could do it. It was easy, but no, you had to learn how to do it. Yeah. Your first 500 photos were probably not properly exposed in some way. Maybe not 500. It should take, Probably a little fewer than 500 to learn that, but still. I wonder how many I've taken. I don't know, but I've taken thousands and You've thousands. Taken thousands and it's of the photos. And, and like, the thing is, I only remember 
an incredibly small portion of those photos mm-hmm. because most of them didn't matter in the end. And I, but now that I'm decent at it, like I can't even say good on the podcast right now. <laughs> like I can't say it. It doesn't feel right say because it. to me, good is even better, and it say. will always be. It's like it's like how it'll never be tomorrow. You know, <laughs> For, I will never be good because as soon as I reach one level, good is actually that level plus one. I think that you should say, I am a good photographer. I am good at using my camera. <laughs> the rest is like artistic vision, man. I can't control whether that's good. That's that's an opinion. And even if nature people, did all the hard work, even if it made peop- spiders. <laughs> that's true. It did make spiders. I didn't make spiders. I don't think it's the job of, photo- of a photographer to make its subject. <laughs> well, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, sometimes if you... That okay, depends. But then you become an artist in a yeah, different way. Depends. Right? A photographer is supposed to capture what's going on <laughs> yeah. in the world. So I will say you're a good, photog- good photographer. I bet you some people in the comments will say that, and you still won't believe it. Yep. <laughs> I will believe I am competent enough to continue and get better, though. So mm-hmm. there's still enough positive in there that I'm not going to hold myself back, and I'll keep working at it. Yeah. And I'll feel really good about one photo I take, like, the same day I take it, or maybe for a few days. Sometimes I, th- I think something's so good that for a few days I'm just like, that was good, and I'm proud of that. But mm-hmm. right after, i got to start thinking, what's the next one? Yeah. Yeah, I totally get that. I think there are different types of imposter syndrome. Yours seems to be more of an all-encompassing thing where – you will never reach a standard that's in your head. Yeah. Whereas mine ebbs and flows a lot more and seems to be pegged to the performance of my last thing. Because I'll make something and I'll be like, that sounds cool. Yeah, I'm a musician. And then, you know, maybe it won't do well or I'll be like, or I'll, I'll learn something new and be like, okay, well, actually that was crap. Yeah. Uh, now that I'm looking at it or, remember, or now that I'm listening back to it and, and I know how proper compression works, uh, I was such an amateur and I'm still an amateur because I haven't done something at this new so level of like taste a, I have. Like a roller coaster. But yeah, it's like a roller coaster, right? Because while I'm making it, I'm like, I think I can do this. I think I actually am a musician. And then, you know, it'll, it'll go back down. Yeah, my, mine's definitely like the carrot hanging in front of my face. <laughs> and I'm just never going to quite get there. But I will keep getting tremendously better. Yeah. I will just always have a high sl- I mean, I do that, like I said in the beginning, I, I do that with, like, friends. Like, uh, we'll hang out. We'll have, like, the, you know, like a, some sort of holiday event. I mean, Halloween one's coming up. It'll probably happen right after that preview for mm-hmm. me, I guess, is afterward I'll be like, I was almost socially skilled there, but I should have asked this question there, or I should have I should have uh, dug in more to what they were saying or, or – I should have kept this sentence away because I spoke too much about myself this time. It would have been better <laughs> if I had cut that one sentence away. No one cares about that sentence. And like always going to be critiquing like it's a performance or something. Yeah. Like I wasn't good enough at friendship today. <laughs> Did you feel this with your um, childhood friends or college friends? I didn't have a lot of friends till late high school. Okay, late high school friends. And at that point, I don't know. I don't remember whether I felt this. Like same I thing. can't imagine you had to. F- you <clears throat> felt this with our college friends. Um, but maybe you did. Oh wait, yeah, I did. I definitely did. You did. I, def- I did in college. Like even with like Clyde and those people. Oh yeah, I could hang out with thirty people, and then act- and then as soon as I leave, feel like oh, I didn't fit in with those thirty people because here's A, B, and C things that I could have improved about that social interaction, hmm. and next time it'll be even better. Hmm. Like the the drive for self improvement is strong, but it has the negative side effect of always focusing on the improvement and never the self. That sounds way smarter than I wanted. See, it I'm to. trying to figure out like how you can, like, what can you do to improve that? Because the practice I, I of that know. is literally socializing. Yeah, I know. And you get good feedback from it, but then you don't believe it. That's yeah. That's, and I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't help. I also have OCD, so you know, my imposter syndrome is exacerbated. That is true. By some other stuff. Because, yeah, I guess it's good to know that like that isn't just so a physical my, thing. You know, it might be extra strong for me because of that. Yeah. But the only thing is that I'm always. I feel good about most things during them. I feel good about my creations. I feel good about the work I do. I feel good about my friendships and I feel good about 
everything when I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. So as long as I focus on the action and, you know, like the now, what am I doing right now? And not focus too much on my self-esteem should be built on what I did yesterday. Well, then I'm probably never going to feel quite right because I'm always going to be looking at yesterday thinking, well, tomorrow might be better than yesterday. Yeah. But if I focus on what I'm doing today, I will probably always feel kind of good about it because in the moment, that's how I tend to feel. It's just like a retrospective discounting of everything I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I get the same feeling. I'll get like a post-creation... I don't want to say depression. It's not like that bad, but I'll, I, I don't know. It's like I'm <laughs> deflating and I'm like, oh, I'm done with that. And I'm, I'm relieved that it's finally out. But now I'm like, well, what am I doing now? Yeah, it feels you like know, you have it's, such a straight purpose the whole time you're yeah. doing it. And it's so, so clear what you're supposed to be doing. This is my life is this right now. And then yeah. when it's done, you're like, oh God, yeah, <laughs> my life isn't that. What is it then? Was it, was it nothing like, the whole in. time? I never have existential dread while creating something yeah never <laughs> but yeah, yeah. when it's done <laughs> yeah this this is uh, i think part of why having an accomplishment log has helped me so much mm. i since i've been keeping it since last not not this year's january the previous year's january what in 2018 2018 january mm-hmm. but every time i do something that i'm kind of proud of i'll i'll write it down I'll, I'll have it in my little accomplishment log so if i'm ever feeling like i didn't do the work or I didn't do anything and I really need to remind myself that I did, I can scroll through there and be like, oh yeah, I remember it actually took me quite a lot of effort to make myself start an Instagram account for my photography. That was really hard at first. Yeah. feels like nothing now, but at first I was really scared to put myself out there and do anything. I don't even tweet because I don't consider my opinions very important, which is ironic because I'm on a podcast. makes no sense. Man, I have tweeted poopity scoop. Yeah, I tweet, those words. I tweet like nothing because I'm like, who cares what my thoughts are right now? <laughs> no one asked. If somebody asks me, I'll say my thoughts all the time. But I'm like, who? A- yeah. no, one, no one asked me to put something here today, so I'm not going to. But maybe that's okay. But, you know. Yeah, like, I think that's I just think like that's my reaction thing. to the social media world is I'm just like, well, no one asked for my opinion. Mm-hmm. I have one. I'm confident in it, but they didn't ask. So I never, I don't do anything like that. But I think that's just an element of personality. And maybe like the existence of social media and our society's importance that we placed upon it makes people who feel like you do feel like they're well, I feel not like doing it part right. Part of it's just humility, right? And I think humility yeah. is a good trait. Yeah. But because right now everything seems so important to get accolades via some other stuff, it's like anti-humility. Mm. And it's hard to not feel a little bit like an imposter in a society that values not what I want to be doing yeah i want to do the art and the creation but then like self-promotion always feels horrible to me because that's not i don't i just want to make the art but in order for anybody to see it i have to be not humble for three seconds Mm -hmm. to put it out there and that's difficult but yeah self-promotion sucks yeah it's it's one of the reasons i do like youtube because like now i can just it just happens and the as much as we love to gripe about the algorithm, the one thing I like about the algorithm is that I know for a fact that putting more effort into the title and the thumbnail and making sure the topic is good and making sure the content <clears throat> is good, which is the art, yeah, that will affect the performance of the video far more than me spending a, like three hours tweeting about it and po- posting on Facebook yeah. and trying to like spam it into forums and be like, hey, has your mom seen my video yet? Like if I spend, I mean, I, I still tweet my videos. I put them in the newsletter, all that. The newsletter might send 1,500 people to the video. A tweet will send like three. A yeah. Facebook post will send like three, right? But a good title versus a bad title, that could be the difference between... 80,000 views and 250,000 views. It's a monstrous difference. And luckily that's not self-promotion. That's just the art, you know? I mean, it's it's part of the art that kind of sucks because you're just like, all right, what kind of title do people like? And you're like trying to get in people's heads and, yeah, you know, but it's at, le- it's at least not pitching yourself like a used car salesman. Like, hey, I got a Corolla over here. You know, the steering wheel's a little loose, but it comes with an air freshener. Check it out. Yeah. Pearlescent blue, they actually discontinued that color. 
2007 model year, so, you know, this is a pretty rare color. You're going to be the talk of the office. Yeah. I guess I didn't, I didn't think about that. Like, the, the whole, like, if somebody isn't naturally that kind of a self promote or, you know, I'm, I'm, like, introverted, and I try to be humble, and I keep my opinions to myself, not because I am shy about them. I'll explain anything. I'll yeah. just I'll just answer any question. But I'm just like, well, no one asked. So I'll let this these people over here talk about this subject and I'll be like, oh, I've got some cool ideas about that. And I won't say anything. <laughs> but now, it, particularly with social media, because like the whole thing, at first it was like talking to your friends. Mm-hmm. And now a lot of them are public. Like, tw- you know, like Twitter especially is, is public. Instagram, is, you can have your account usually, it's probably public. Yeah. And it's like, it's no longer just about your friends. It's about, did you succeed in front of all these strangers? And mm-hmm. that's just like hard to do for the kind of person that would normally be reserved. Yeah. So I guess that brings up a point about so I have to feel like an being a good friend. And I, I don't think this applies as much to social media as it does to real life and to interpersonal communication. But for people out there who have a friend who maybe thinks like you do, it would probably be a good idea to proactively think, hey, maybe I should ask Martin what he thinks about this thing. Because if I'm having a conversation, my natural inclination is just to talk about whatever the heck I want to talk about, and I will expect other people to chime in with what they think. Yeah. But now I know that's not how you think. You'll just listen and listen like, what do you think about this? Yeah, I will totally let two people discuss something, and I'll be like, I think that what I have to say on this subject would be really helpful, but eh. <laughs> <laughs> but eh. <laughs> but like, what if it's not that I'm just interrupting them thinking my opinion's important, and that's just, I don't want to assume that I have a more valid opinion than they do, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a much more humble position. But that's difficult right now, humble. so maybe imposter syndrome is even easier to have now. Because, you know, I don't know what percentage of people are more naturally introverted, but yeah. it's going to be harder to succeed in the in this world of extroversion, sort of like external feedback mm-hmm. focused thing we got going on right now. Yeah. And I have to wonder, has it always been like that? I mean, probably in some in way, this, obviously, know? it's hard for me to compare to previous generations because I did not live them. I remember not having the Internet, mm-hmm. but... Well, I, had, I guess like I had in, different problems in the past, back then. There, there, it was a lot more focus on gatekeeping, and yet you, you know you had to submit your resume and all that kind of stuff. But it was oh, yeah. much more formal proceedings for that. So I think there was more of a focus on, you know, building your body of work, and then you kind of like you're doing all that, and then you have like your shot to apply for a job. Yeah, you're Whereas officially like, validated by the system, basically. Yeah. Now it's like, what's your social media presence like? How many articles have you posted on LinkedIn? Hmm. Oh, you you don't even have 30,000 followers? The art's great, but like... Yeah. Eh. I think 30,000 followers... If no there's one like sees some, it, doesn't um, matter. There's some advertising watchdog out there <clears> that defined a celebrity as anybody with, I think, I think it was 30,000 followers. Oh, really? Yeah. So when they, when they put that out there, there were all these people that were like, I guess I'm a celebrity now. <laughs> where's my million dollars where's my music video with kanye yeah <laughs> i i think they put it there as like it was the threshold for more scrutiny in terms of uh, uh, okay. advertising disclosures yeah they got to put the threshold somewhere yeah because if somebody with like 100 followers is like i really like this beard brand hair cream which full disclosure since i guess i'm a celebrity beard brand has sent me free hair cream before yeah <laughs> It's the brand for your beard, I assume. <laughs> Except for I don't... Well, actually, no, they do have good beard oil, too. But I only use the, the hair stuff. That's just your skull uh, top beard. It's my... It's, I yeah, wanted to say skull beard. beard until I remembered the whole thing is your skull. And I was like, what? No, this is my... The whole this thing? This is my jaw? That's not your skull anymore? My That's cranial a, beard. Cranial beard. There we go. So That's yes, the word, yes. Yeah, I use their the right styling clay with. for my cranial it was beard. Too late. It actually is. I'm a biology imposter. I don't know bones. <laughs> it is the best hair styling product I've used. I go to the salon sometimes, and I'm like, well, maybe I'll try what they have here, and it's never as good. So, yeah. Disclosed. Shout out to Beard Brand. But yeah, I don't know. I guess we're celebrities now. Yeah. Oh, wait. You don't have 30,000 followers. That means you, you can <laughs> no, talk anything you want with no disclosure. It's totally fine, except for it'll probably put liability I've on the business. I've been stuck at the same number of followers forever. <laughs> On Twitter, because I never do a single thing. Oh, yeah. And on Instagram, because I stopped posting for, like, 
months. Well, as while we've I was learned, doing other stuff, and I was just like, eh, eh. more external validation. Honestly, just means more visibility and more pressure. Such a small percentage of the follower count ever engages with anything that I'm just like, what? Like, Still, does it really matter that much? Go follow me on Instagram so I can feel more pressure. Yeah, and more dread. <laughs> yeah, I, I do That's love. That's what it's like. I do want follow me so that I take this more seriously at the expense of my other interests. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, what what is up with that? It's like, well, like you have to. It's like there's expectations now. I've got so many followers. I better do something. Yeah, everybody. Like you, everybody's you, looking at me. I need you to look do something at, like cool, like a trick. You look at so how the, the accumulation of certain things, like followers, money accolades whatever like there are definitely good things about it but they have only brought more pressure more uh i guess feelings like you can't fail like more anxiety but you still want more yeah see so again like i'm trying to (laughs) ignore that stuff and focus on the work because if i focus on any of that it never stops it only Mm. like gets worse and pulls me away from everything i think there's like this core human fear and dread of uh, sliding down, right? And also plateauing because you're just like, well, if I'm plateauing, like at well, any moment I could slide down. So even though more followers, more fame, more success, more money is going to bring more pressure, more problems, I still want it because the alternative would be sliding down into oblivion. Well, it's scary because, you know, like, I mean, at some point, my out of my entire life, one of those days, Probably was my prime, right? <laughs> Which one is that? And has it already it happened? In the future. I hope that it hasn't already <laughs> happened. Like my, uh, the whole thing, when you look at it, there's going to be one day where I was peak Martin, and yeah. I really hope that day has not happened yet. I, I hope it's still going to happen in the future. Yeah. So, like, you got to keep working because otherwise, you're like, it was probably behind me, and I know it. Man, like, Uh-oh. I'm just thinking about this. Like, like, like there's existential a, dread now. There is a part of me that wants to be a well-known musician. Even though I know, like the time I spent just derping around last night making what I wanted, that's probably going to be more fun than if like I've got an album out and now I'm like, oh boy, I got to get my second album out and it better not better not be a flop. Don't want to be one of those sophomore slump guys. That's there's going to be all this pressure. It's going to feel worse. Yeah, you know, I'm, not to say it's going to feel bad. Like it still would be awesome to be that, but like you. <sighs> I think like there's you can recognize implicitly that when you're just doing it for fun, it actually is more fun, but you still want all the baggage of doing it professionally. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. <sighs> Human brains are weird. Validation is hard. We feel like imposters. We want to get to the next level where we don't think we're going to be imposter, but then we get there and we still feel like one, and yet we still want to get to the next level. I don't yeah. know. Just you always think that everyone's thing, an imposter, all mm-hmm. of them. I think what what killed my imposter syndrome for YouTube was uh, seeing the guys from ASAP Science at VidCon, and they had I think four million subscribers, and they literally said like, "We felt when we were a small channel that once we get to a million, it'll be great." It wasn't, and then we felt like, "Oh, once we get to four million or five million, it'll be great." Nah, still the same. Still feel like imposters. Still feel too much pressure. Still feel like. Everything we put out has to be perfect, and it never measures up. I feel like so much of life is like that. (laughs) It's like, yep, you know, you got to be the whole focus on the present because the hedonic treadmill and so many other things. Mm -hmm. Basically, however you feel normally is how you're just going to (laughs) feel regardless. It's just the situations change. Well, so I I don't like to go too far with that philosophy, No, like you can change it, but it's, it's like you're the base level that you can accomplish Mm. If I can find a way to appreciate, like, the, a normal day, I will probably keep appreciating things. Yeah. So the trick is to learn to appreciate the average stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's a good way to put it, because I don't, I don't like that. Yeah. I don't like that as a base statement, because <clears throat> it tells people who are depressed, you're always going to be depressed. Yeah, I don't want to say that. I definitely have not had fun with depression at any point. Mm-hmm. And there are things that you can absolutely do to raise your, your average day. I think we had yeah. a whole episode it's about like, that. It's like, yeah, the, the the trick is really just to focus on the, the present thing, the average day, the work you do, not the results that come from it, because who cares about it? Once it's done, work on the new one. Mm-hmm. Just And then you're always going to appreciate whatever's coming on Yeah, a little bit more. Yeah, I, yeah maybe a, a more nuanced way to put it is like, 
more external validation, more metrics, more stats, more followers, it's probably not going to change your average day, you know? Yeah. And there's all those studies about like, I'm sure the number has changed, but when the study came out, it was like $75,000 a year for like a family of four represents the maximum amount of income that actually will raise your happiness as your income goes up. So like, you know, making $25,000 a year versus making $75,000 a year, you will be happier because now you can not fret at the grocery store. Yeah, because you've removed negative feelings. But between 75 and like $150,000, you may be able to buy more crap that you wanted, but you're not going to be happier. Yeah. Just just how it works. You know, there's a a certain threshold where you just don't need more material wealth to be happy. But then the insidious mind bug shows up of, well, I need to make more money so I can save for retirement. Because what happens if I get hurt or have a family or need more money? So I yeah. can't slow down. And I wonder if there's a number like that for like other numbers, you know, like followers. If I hit, is there a certain number of followers I needed before I was okay? I and think then the I stopped? number of followers is, is it zero. Two? I think it's zero. <laughs> I think that, you know, and, and uh, I probably am not going to go delete my Instagram for this reason, but um, I don't think I'm any happier with it as I would be without it. Now in the moment, yeah, I like true. being able, to, I like having an outlet where it's like, you know, I made this thing. It doesn't go on the YouTube channel. I'm just gonna put it up there. But if Instagram deleted itself tomorrow, I probably wouldn't feel any less happy as a person. Yeah. I think I really only like the, uh, the fact that it can give me a goal to mm-hmm. do the work because without like the pressure of, oh, I said I was going to post this many times, I wouldn't have made myself go, I should go out and take some photos today. I should go do this. Like, But you could have easily set yeah. the same goal. And I could like, have hey, set Tom, a different. I'm going to email you a photo every day. Yeah, I could just you're, like. You're subscribing to Martin's photo newsletter. Formulate it differently. Subscriber count, one. The benefit it gives me is the <laughs> slight pressure to go do the work. Mm-hmm. Not, the, not the followers or the numbers that are often random and sometimes photos that I don't even like. Ashley's like, you should post that. And I'm like, I don't, it's not good enough. And then it's like one of my <laughs> best performing ones. I'm like, yeah. okay, I guess I don't understand my own photography. Mm-hmm. Yes. I do believe in the pressure to do the work though. Yeah. Especially in things where you feel a, imposter like a, syndrome. Like a regular website where I would post that stuff instead just mm-hmm. so that I had. I used to have one. I had a photo gallery website. It was one of the very first websites I ever built. It was like part of what taught me HTML. Didn't look good, but nope, it had like a not. cool photo thing where you could click a side button and scroll through them and they faded. That was a cool little trick I coded. But yeah, uh, I think we've talked for long enough. So the last thing I want to say here is something else that Dave mentioned in that meeting we had at the recording studio. He said that anybody who's ever done anything worth doing has felt in over their head at some point. So, like, if you feel in over your head, that's probably a good sign. If you always feel like you are prepared for what you have gotten yourself into, then you're probably not shooting high enough. That's a good point. You know? If you're like, I'm not going to make a song until I know every single aspect of of compression and saturation and EQ and MIDI and velocity and quantization, and I'm going to watch 16 different courses on Skillshare before I make my first song, so that way I'm perfectly prepared then you're probably not shooting high enough. You just need to open the program and start dinking around and be like, well, this doesn't sound good. I don't understand it. And then you go figure it out. I think when you have that pressure of feeling over your head, you paddle harder and you learn faster. You progress faster. So hopefully something in this episode was useful. This is... I'm going to call it. This is the longest episode we've ever done. Is it? Wait, maybe not. We've done pretty long ones. We've done a couple of really long ones, especially like Path to College. And I, I still think possibly the longest one I ever did was the uh, car buying episode, which I had to split into two different episodes. Oh, yeah. Because that was like a three hour long interview with those guys. But this is a pretty long one. So if you're still here, thanks for watching. Hopefully you found something useful here. You can find show notes for this episode over at CIGpodcast.com slash 278 or you can go over to cigpodcast.com with no slashes no trailing letters numbers symbols batman symbols wingdings or cubert things that's a thing none of those just cigpodcast.com 
to find out how to subscribe to this show. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, iCloud, not iCloud, <laughs> iHeartRadio, <laughs> all the things. We're on, we're on them all, I think. <laughs> um, I've been listening to my podcast on Spotify, actually. I kind of like it. Oh, now. yeah, yeah. The only thing I don't like about podcasts on Spotify is the show notes are not clickable. Really? I think, it, so just, like I think it just pulls in the description, not the actual, like, big show notes. Mm. So if you're listening on Spotify, you just might want to go to CIGpodcast.com if you want those show notes because you can't get them in Spotify. Sorry, bro. And I, I don't think Spotify sees it in their best interest to allow external links within their app. So I don't yeah. think we're going to get that. But, eh. I would still say follow us on Spotify because then you could follow my musician page on Spotify. Mm. About to get famous. Subtle self-promotion. About to get famous and feel no happier for it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway, if you enjoyed this podcast, you can give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. I think that helps with the algorithms. I'm not sure. That's the common wisdom in podcasting, but no one's ever been able to verify it. But we enjoy your feedback, and I do read every single review over there. Uh, Also, you can just share this podcast with a friend. If they haven't heard about it before, they may enjoy it. But beyond that, thanks for hanging out with us, and we will see you in the next episode. Stay cute.